Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk.
called to confession. We come before God, not as despised to sinners, but as beloved children. With the confidence of the children of God, let us humbly confess our sins. assurance. Rejoice and be glad. Our God is full of mercy, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Through Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Dare to believe in the gift of a new beginning and be at peace.
Our scripture, which we just heard by song, is Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And a man, lame from birth, was being carried in. People would lay him daily at the gate of the temple, called the Beautiful Gate, so that he could ask for alms from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and they said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, thinking that they were going to, he was going to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have I will give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with amazement and wonder at what had happened to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. All of us have seen these folks standing on the street corner asking for money. Sometimes if you go the same way to work, you will see the same people day after day. This man had prime real estate. Right outside the temple gates where people would come to pray every afternoon, he hoped to catch them in a generous mood. If you've ever passed someone on the way to church and you felt extra guilty for not stopping, that is what this man was counting on. Since he was lame, he would have had no way to support himself. He couldn't be a carpenter or a farmer or pretty much any other occupation in the ancient world. It was very physical. But he did have one thing going for him. He had friends, and these friends would take him to this place every day. Peter and John, two of the inner circle of the apostles, were going to the temple to pray as good Jewish people would do. Even though they had begun to follow Jesus, they were still mostly a Jewish community. We learned last week that those in Jerusalem in this early church decided to have a common fund and a common purse that they would use. So when Peter and John claimed to not have any money, they are probably telling the truth. They personally did not. They could have told this man, we'll go back and let our treasurer know that you are here and they'll be by tomorrow with some funds for you. But instead, they look at him intently. Biblical scholar N.T. Wright asks of this moment, what were they looking for? A sincere spirit ready to receive more than he had asked for? A heart full of pain and sorrow ready to be touched by God's healing love? Whatever it was, the two apostles not only look intently at this nameless man, they require he look back at them, straight in the eye. This is reminiscent of how Jesus would have these encounters whenever he healed someone. You might remember the bent-over woman who is bent over with infirmities so much so that she could not look anyone in the eye. But Jesus unbends her, lifts her up, and stares her full in the face. Those who were lame or poor were thought to be suffering because of their sins or the sins of their fathers, and God that was punishing them for those sins. So they should be full of shame, their eyes downcast in humility. 
But of course, Jesus' ministry, which the apostles are continuing in this moment, show time and time again that physical disability is not a punishment, but sometimes just the way life is. Jesus is more concerned with those who might be spiritually blind or lame, crippled with their greed, jealousy, fear, or pride. <coughs> this man looks at Peter and John, expecting some money, but could he even imagine that his life would change so drastically forever? When I was in seminary, I did not have a lot of disposable income. I was just barely scraping by as I paid for school and tried to get out with as little debt as I could. And even to this day, I don't carry a lot of cash on me. But whenever I came across someone walking down the street who asked for money, if I had time, I would say to them, I can't give you anything today, but I have time. Let's sit down and tell me your story. I would ask their name and who they were, and sometimes they would give me a spiel that I knew was probably not true. But a few times, there were moments of genuine connection between us. They would tell me who they were and why they couldn't work anymore, whether it was a physical ailment, emotional concerns, or perhaps a relationship with family member that meant they no longer had a home. If I could, I'd give them a granola bar or a cup of coffee from the fast food place around the corner. I'd hope that the human interaction would have impacted them just as much as that small moment of charity. And for Peter and John, they knew they had the power of Jesus with them. So in Jesus' name, they declared this man should stand up and walk and lifted their hand down to help him. And sure enough, his heart must have been sincere and full of devotion because not only did he get up and walk and go tell his friends what had happened, he goes in with them to the temple to pray, walking and jumping and praising God with all that he has, overjoyed with God's healing in his life. This miracle affected not only him, but the whole community. Because they had seen him day after day, the community knew him, and they saw this moment of devotion and his physical healing. And the passage tells us they're filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Not only did God's power act in his life, it spread to the whole community. And his response of devotion probably equally affected everyone around them. Today, people with disabilities are protected under the law and are to be given equal opportunity of employment and access to public spaces. But there are some within the disability community that do not see it as a brokenness, as something to be healed. For example, for some in the deaf community, they do not consider themselves disabled. Although it's complicated, there are some who choose to get cochlear implants or surgeries to correct their hearing. But for some, being deaf means having your own language and culture. And if a Christian were to come to them and say, in heaven, everything about you will be healed, including your hearing, they would be offended. They'd say, I don't need that to be healed. This is part of who I am. It's part of my culture. You should learn from me and my community instead of trying to fix us. For years, I've listened to a podcast called Sermon Brainwave, a ministry of a site called Working Preacher out of Luther Seminary in Minneapolis. One of the voices on the podcast is a man named Rolf Jacobson who specializes in Old Testament studies. When the pandemic happened, the podcasters were not able to get together in person to record like they normally would. So like many of us, they were on Zoom. And instead of just audio recording, as 
they were used to doing, they decided to video record, record their session, post it to YouTube, so you could either listen in the car on the podcast like you normally would, or see their conversation play out on Zoom. This was the first time I had seen Rolf Jacobson, so when I was watching this video, it became apparent that he was sitting in his kitchen with his cat nearby, but he needed to grab something behind him, and he rolled his wheelchair back, and I was struck. I hadn't known he was disabled. He was only a disembodied voice in my mind. But I looked up his biography, and I came to find out that in 1982, he had cancer as a teenager, and his legs had to be amputated in order to save his life. Of course, we know theoretically that people with disabilities can do anything. They can be professors or pastors, and it shouldn't have surprised me the way it did. But it does impact his perspective when he reads scripture and ours when we hear his sermons. He said in a blog post that since 1982, every thought, every idea, every concept that he has ever had takes place in a body with no legs. Over time, the realities of my body have deeply shaped the types of ideas I entertain. Hospitality, worship, love, relationship, space, justice, and the sanctity of life. How I conceive of all these things, he says, is deeply shaped by my body. Maybe Peter and John were moved to reflect on God's generosity because of this man's experience. Even though they had initiated this interaction between themselves and this man, they perhaps did not know they would make a friend, and he would teach them about God in this moment. I don't think we should read the story and assume everyone with enough faith will be healed from their infirmities. I know it happens. I have heard stories of it today, and in my own life, although these seem small in comparison, I feel like I, there's been moments where I prayed as a teenager. I had a really bad stomach ache before a test. Somehow, miraculously, it went away. Usually, I wasn't that grateful for it. But in the moment, I was grateful. Or more commonly, these days, feels like sometimes I'm just inches away from a really bad car accident, and I truly believe that it was God's protection that allows it not to happen, and that God is keeping me safe in those moments. But there is a helpful voice when we think about those who might pray and not get healed. Scholar Kate Bowler is a professor at Duke Divinity School. She wrote her dissertation some years back on the prosperity gospel. So for years, she would go from church to church where people would come forward to be healed, and they were. But then, she, at age 35, got incurable stage 4 colon cancer. She was a good person. This shouldn't have happened to her. She was upset. The people around her told her, if you just have faith, God will heal you. But she saw, as time went on, and she was not healed, that people were frustrated, that she was still suffering and not being healed. So in hindsight, she has reflected that relationships with God should not be contractual. Instead, God's love is with us whether we are healed or not, whether the healing happens in the way we expect or not. She reflects that if you're one of the many people who takes medicine, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. For her, she wound up having an experimental treatment that saved her life, and without that, she would not be here today. She reflects that we have to belong to each other. The more helpless and reliant I became, she says, the more I realized how important it is to have a web of obligation where we don't feel embarrassed by our neediness. 
Her lovely, sweet, local Methodist church fed her through especially the first year of that hard, hard diagnosis. And she knows she's been held up by people who chose to love her and stick with her no matter what. This is different than the individualism of the, if you just have enough faith, you will get better. God's grace is on all of us. And how that healing happens can be communal. And it can look the way we hope or not. The nameless man in the story had a community of friends from the very beginning who loved him and took care of him in this way. So I have to believe that when he was healed, he sought to pay it forward and dedicate his life to taking care of others who might need it. It's just a natural response. Kate Bowler is a good example. <coughs> now that she has a healthy quality of life and is able to do what she could do before, she dedicates so much of her time to videos and podcasts and writings where she encourages others who might be struggling. She also appreciates the life she has more and more. For all of us, as we are impacted by this ancient man's story of healing, let us too be full of compassion and see the dignity of every human and every creature we encounter. Let us look them full in the face. Let us allow the stories of others to impact us as we imagine things like worship, hospitality, justice, and God's love. And most of all, let us remember how interconnected we are and how we can rely on each other, even in our neediness. And let us each show up for one another when we most need it. Thanks be to God. As an interconnected community, we also know that we are connected with the church of ages past. And so before us is an affirmation of faith from the Confession of Belhar in South Africa in 1986, written after the racial injustices that had taken place. So let us stand and together say this affirmation. <laughs> We believe in the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who gathers, protects, and cares for the church through word and spirit. This God has done since the beginning of the world and will do to the end. We believe in one holy, universal Christian church, the communion of saints called from the entire human family. We believe that Christ's work of reconciliation is made manifest in the church. We believe that God has revealed himself as the one who wishes to bring about justice and true peace among people. That God, in a world full of injustice and enmity, is in a special way the God of the destitute, the poor, and the wronged. That God frees his prisoner restores sight to the blind, that God supports the downtrodden, protects the stranger, helps orphans and widows, and blocks the path of the ungodly, that God wishes to teach the church to do what is good and to seek the right. Jesus is Lord, to the one and only God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be the honor and the glory forever. We continue to have online worship, online giving available through our website. And as you notice, the offering plates are going to stay at the back of the sanctuary for you to give as you come in or as you go out. Jesus draws us from the margins into one communal feast. He draws us out of a crowd toward healing. He draws us from death to new life. Each day, God finds the way that we need to be loved and challenged and calls us to minister to others 
and warm hospitality, healing mercies, and the promise of resurrection and new life. We respond to this marvelous call through our giving this day. Let us offer up the gifts we have in gratitude and praise. for the 
those whose lives have been irreversibly changed by the pandemic, those whose health continues to suffer, those who grieve, those whose livelihoods have been affected. We know that in prayer, we can consider one another, those in our neighborhoods, our cities, our country, and our world. And we lift all those concerns to you now. We especially pray for those who lead, that you would give our leaders wisdom and grace in all that they do. We pray for all first responders who continue to help those who are sick and dying. We pray for those who experience housing insecurity, who are hungry or poor. We especially consider the children whose reliable meal sources at school will no longer be an option. We especially pray for those who are in distress, for those who are struggling in their faith, and we pray that all may be given assurance and comfort. Continue to comfort and challenge us, Lord God, through your holy word and through our life stories of one another. We know and believe in the power of Jesus Christ and in the power of praying in his name. And so it is that we do today, in one voice, praying the prayer he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil.
yesterday, today, and always. And we are invited to join that train, too. So as you go, know that the Lord is with you and guides you. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord's countenance be lifted upon you and give you peace.